Good afternoon. My name is Alex Zaragoza, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, I, but first, I want to thank the um, Arts and Design Program at the University of California at Berkeley uh, under the leadership of Vice Chancellor Shannon Jackson. I also want to thank the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive uh, for their cooperation in this lecture series. Uh, and a particular thanks for the donors that have made this public lecture series possible. Today's lecture is also being done in, co in collaboration with Cal Performances, uh, as well as the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Our guest speaker today is Ahmad Sarkanga, who will discuss the African diaspora in relation to the performance of the that will take place on Saturday at 8 p.m. entitled Routes of, Routes of Slavery by Jody Caval. I want to um, emphasize the fact that Professor Sakanga is a professor in the Department of History at The Ohio State University. His work encompasses the study of Africa, the African diaspora, the Middle East, with a focus on slavery, labor, and popular culture. The geographical focus of his research is the Sudan, the Nile Valley, North Africa, and the Persian Gulf. His research has been supported by fellowships and grants from various institutions, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew Mellon Fellowship Program at Harvard University, the American Council of Learned Societies, as well as the Social Science Research Council, among others. I want to um, emphasize the fact that today he'll be speaking particularly about, how's re about his research on the Persian Gulf. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ahmad Sakanga. Alex. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Berkeley Art of Design and uh, the Haas Institute for inviting me. And uh, it has been a pleasure coming here from the Midwest, especially during this time of the year. Um, my uh, presentation actually just slight change in the title is will be on the uh, enslavement of Africans in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and I will be talking about the history of slavery in that region and the African diaspora uh, and the cultural impact of uh, Africans in the Persian Gulf. There had been a number of studies on that. Uh, in fact, there was recently some uh, program on Africa worldwide on African music in the Persian Gulf. Um, the study of African diaspora has become fashionable in recent years, uh, especially uh, in the Atlantic world. But there has been very little attention to the Indian Ocean uh, and the Persian Gulf. Uh, the most recent uh, work of uh, Matthew Hopper from UCLA, uh, and of course, Gwen Campbell, Ned Alpers, has really put the spotlight on African diaspora in the Persian Gulf and the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, for some of you who watch the World Cup when they see Saudi Arabian team, they wonder, is this an African team or uh, a Saudi Arabian team? And you wonder, how did these people end up in the, in the, the Persian Gulf? So I would first deal with the uh, oh sorry yeah. okay um, so if you look at the map actually the history of the African diaspora in the uh, Persian Gulf and Arabia is actually much older than the Atlantic uh, world uh, it is uh, well known that is slavery from East Africa and from the Horn of Africa, from the Horn of Africa meaning the countries today of uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, and so forth, what is called Northeast Africa. And then the East African coast, uh, Tanzania, Zanzibar, uh, Kenya, and so forth. So this is, has been a very much older source of slaves uh, from, for that region. Uh, but slavery in Arabia actually predates the rise of Islam. Uh, until the 13th century, this is also what is 
interesting and different about uh, slavery in Arabia is uh, the majority of slaves before the 13th century came actually from Eastern Europe and from Persia and other places. In other words, non-African slaves. But after the 13th century, after the rise of the Russian Empire and its expansion, uh, Africa became the major source of slaves. Uh, and this continued and it reached the peak in the 19th century as a result of major transformation in the region's economy, especially uh, the development of pearling industry after pearls became a fashion uh, as well as the production of dates. So the integration of the Persian Gulf into the world economy uh, became a major factor in the development and the rise of slavery. Um, there's a great deal of debate about uh, how many people were actually taken from East Africa as, and, and Northeast Africa to the Indian uh, Ocean or the Persian Gulf. Uh, there are a wide range of estimates. For instance, uh, E.B. Martin uh, estimated that about 2,500 slaves were exported annually from East Africa during the period of 1770s and 1829. Uh, the numbers increased to about 4,000 in the 1840s and then about 6,500 in the 1850s. Uh, Ralph Austin of the University of Chicago gave an estimate of 6,250 slaves were exported annually from the Swahili coast uh, and uh, an equal number from the Red Sea uh, during the same period. But he later is, uh, uh, escalated down his numbers to about 3,000 uh, a year. Uh, Thomas Ricks gave a figure of about 500 to 600 uh, annually in the 18th century. However, the Tanzanian scholar Abdul Sharif uh, expressed major reservation about these numbers because uh, he argued that uh, the nature of the Gulf economy during this period could not have justified such a large number of slaves from Africa. According to him, uh, British military intervention in the Gulf uh, to suppress the slave trade and the destruction of uh, Arab uh, ships uh, in the 19th century uh, had really diminished the uh, export of slaves uh, from East Africa. Uh, he argued that the majority of slaves who were taken, who were people who were enslaved in East Africa in the 19th century, most of them were kept in the, uh, along the coast in Zanzibar in the plantations that were created by the Omanis in the uh, 19th century. However, the recent study of uh, Matthew Hopper, which just came out uh, two years ago, he asserted that uh, the Gulf uh, econ economic boom uh, in the 19th century in connection with the development of pearl industry as well as date cultivation generated a huge demand for labor and led to a big increase in the importation of slaves from East Africa. Furthermore, uh, Hopper argued, questioned the usefulness of uh, using such terms or paradigms as Islamic or Arab slavery uh, and slave trade. Uh, which viewed the institution of slavery as an intrinsic feature of Arab and Muslim societies. Rather, uh, Hopper argued that uh, instead of looking at slavery only through the prism of religion uh, and culture, he, we should uh, look at the rapid growth of slavery in the Gulf in the 19th century and uh, examine it within the context of the transformation of the region's economy and its integration into the global market. In his view, the development of these developments led to major changes in the roles of slaves in Arabia. While slavery is part of the world, was often associated with domestic slavery. Slavery in the 19th century Arabia, uh, they performed a wide range of tasks, including farming, fishing, pearl diving, and other uh, jobs. The major areas of pro date productions uh, were southern Iraq, eastern Arabia, Oman, uh, while pearl industry was concentrated in Bahrain, Qatar, uh, and uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates and Red Sea and so forth. Uh, the growing number of slaves, the demand for slaves also led to increase in their prices. Uh, for instance, uh, from East Africa in 1850, the price of slaves in Zanzibar was about five to $10. Uh, in Muscat, about $25. And in uh, Bushir in Iran was about uh, $40. Uh, 
Now, uh, in the paper also I talk about the routes uh, of slaves. Um, yeah, Northeast Africa was a major source of slaves for Arabia from the pre-Islamic era to the, the, to the 20th century. The Red Sea has been part of the Indian Ocean trading network and served as a major link between the two regions since antiquity. Although commercial activities and the slave trade from this region fluctuated at various times, it increased in the 19th century in response to the rapid growth in commerce uh, in the region. Uh, products from Bombay, such as cotton, silk, and so forth, uh, and tin were imported, while export from Ethiopia, Sudan included ivory, coffee, wax, gold, ostrich feather, just to name a few things. The opening of the Suez Canal, which transformed the Red Sea um, into a major corridor linking the Mediterranean with the Western Indian Ocean, and enhanced the position of such ports as Swakin, Masawa, Jeddah, and uh, Aden. Uh, these ports flourished uh, in, uh, in tandem with the expansion of the international trade. Within the Red Sea, there were a number of slave trading systems and networks that were closely linked to one another. They include the Nile Valley, the Abyssinian or Ethiopian, the Somali coast, just to name a few. Before the 19th century, the areas of present-day Sudan uh, were dominated by two Muslim kingdoms, known as the Fung and the Four, and both kingdoms obtained slaves from non-Muslim communities uh, south of their borders uh, to use them as laborers, soldiers, uh, and so forth. Uh, slave ownership was uh, limited to the nobility and the ruling elite. However, uh, the conquest of the Sudan in 1820 by Muhammad Ali Basha, the Ottoman ruler of Egypt, had completely transformed the situation and turned the Nile Valley into one of the most active slave dealing zones. Uh, Muhammad Ali's main objective was to acquire slaves for his new army and to exploit uh, the country's natural resources. Um, there were several slave routes from Sudan to Arabia. Uh, they were obtained from parts of the upper Nile regions in Western Sudan and sent to Northern Sudanese markets. Uh, and then from there, they were exported to Egypt uh, and, and so forth. Um, one of the oldest and persistent sources of slaves were West African pilgrimage who uh, came from West Africa across the Sahel and across the, the Red Sea into uh, Arabia. Uh, so today in Arabia, in many parts of Arabia, you have a large population of West African descent. Uh, some of them uh, were enslaved after they arrived there. Uh, and some of them uh, actually were uh, uh, the, the went on pilgrimage basically for that uh, reason. Um, let me uh, uh, focus now on uh, the um, uh, the main uh, role of the slaves uh, uh, in in the Persian Gulf. Um, the supply of slaves from East Africa began to dry and became much more risky as a result of the anti-slavery measures by the British Navy. Uh, people of African descent living in Arabia, regardless of whether they were freeborn, recent immigrant, or uh, liberated slaves, became the main target of kidnapping and enslavement, particularly in the 1920s uh, and later on in the 1950s and so forth. So it, should, it is, should be assumed that the overwhelming majority of these people were Muslims, since many of them were either born in the region or arrived recently. The enslavement of these people uh, is, is of significant importance because it was a clear contradiction to uh, the Islamic uh, norms, which prohibits the enslavement of fellow Muslims. Now, it's clear, for example, that the divergence between the ideals and the social reality in Muslim societies. Uh, in this regard, the uh, Gulf stand as a sharp contract to uh, the Maghreb or Morocco uh, where uh, the uh, Moroccan ruler in the uh, 17th century tried to enslave a black Muslim known as the Haratin uh, from the Sahara uh, region. One of the most uh, active slave dealings in this area was Yemen uh, and the Hijaz, Western uh, Arabia, from where captains were taken to Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Najd, and the Gulf. Uh, it is not surprising that significant number of enslaved people in Qatar and in the UAE and so forth came from Yemen and uh, from that region. Um, 
both old and recently established African communities in Yemen became the major target of kidnapping and enslavement. Uh, some of the captives were born into slavery, others uh, were uh, freed slaves. Uh, most of the kidnapping was done by Bedouin tribes in Eastern and Central Arabia, and they were sold in Mecca, Medina, and other regions in uh, Arabia itself. Um, captives were often sold multiple times within the region. Uh, the sources from on which this slavery, uh, this uh, 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 research was based, uh, is based on testimonies by slaves themselves, uh, who were uh, went to the various British agencies and told their stories. This is the closest thing we have to uh, what you might call here slave narratives. Uh, in the 19th century, the British established various agencies uh, in the Gulf, in Iran, in Basra, in Bahrain, Sharjah, uh, and so forth. And very often, the slaves who were escaped, they would go to these agencies, and then they would tell their story, how they were kidnapped, who, who would enslave them, uh, how many times they were sold, and so forth. And then they would be given uh, what is called manumission certificate, or uh, certificate of uh, liberation. Uh, so that really became uh, a major source. There are about uh, several thousand of these documents in the British Library uh, in London. Now, uh, as I said earlier, I would want to focus on the social and economic conditions of enslaved Africans in the Gulf. Uh, in the early 20th century, enslaved Africans formed a significant part of the population of the Gulf. Uh, the following uh, numbers actually are given a survey by a British geographer who visited the region at the end of the 18th century. For instance, in Bahrain, they, number, they equaled about 11% of the total population. That was in 1905. Uh, in Qatar, about 22% of the population, uh, uh, of about 6,000. Uh, in Kuwait, about 11%. Uh, in uh, UAE and other areas, about 28%. In Muscat, Oman, about 25%. Uh, so that's really a very significant number. As in the rest of the world, slavery in the Gulf had an industrial as well as a domestic components. Male slaves were employed as laborers, soldiers, guards, porters, uh, and workers in menial jobs. During the pearling boom of the 19th century and early 20th century, many male slaves were developed to pearl diving but continued to perform other tasks during the off pearling season. Female slaves were used as domestic servants, cooks, cleaners, child manders, entertainers, and so on. Uh, slavery in Arabia was a complex web of paternalism, benevolence, domination, and brutality. Slaves were regarded as members of the owner's family, but they were also considered property that could be sold, inherited, or given as gifts and were sometimes overworked, uh, flogged for disobedience and resistance. The conditions of enslaved people and their treatment changed over time, and they were shaped by the prevailing social and economic conditions. Treatment from, varied from one family to another, from one tribe to another. It was also determined by personal qualities and the status of the owner. In general, the status of domestic slaves, particularly those working in the households of the ruling families, and wealthy people were somewhat better than those in the fields. The slaves of the ruling families and the wealthy were fed and clothed, married to other slaves, and were often freed uh, after serving their masters for uh, some uh, years. Enslaved people in the elite households were su supervised by overseas, and they were responsible for assigning uh, tasks to uh, people working under them. Uh, they wore special uniforms, and viewed themselves as having a higher status than the slaves of ordinary people. Uh, slaves of the ruling family were also used as bodyguards and soldiers, uh, and some of them reached very high positions in the palaces. Uh, like the slave soldiers of the medieval Islamic caliphates, these guards were valued for their loyalty and allegiance, and the rulers became heavily dependent uh, upon them, and we have numerous uh, examples of this. Uh, now, the above mentioned cases show some kind of benevolent treatment and benign condition. However, there were many other cases that pointed to harsh treatment and uh, revealed uh, the precarious status of the enslaved people uh, in the Gulf. Slaves were still considered the property and were subject of the owner and were subjected to various forms of abuse. 
they were beaten, rented out, sold, and given as a gift. They were often separated from their families as a result of the sale or transfer to settle debt uh, and other obligations. Uh, and that especially happened in the 1930s, uh, in the 1940s, when the pearl industry collapsed as a result of the Japanese uh, pearling, uh, uh, cultural pearling. And uh, as a result, many owners tried to get rid of their slaves, uh, sold them, uh, breaking families, uh, and so forth. So it's important to look at uh, treatment over time because there's a great deal of debate about the nature of slavery in Muslim societies. Some apologists for Islamic uh, slavery would argue that they were treated uh, uh, better, they were integrated, the families, um, uh, others who would try to apply the uh, Atlantic model point to the fact that the slaves were still considered shuttle uh, slaves and uh, uh, considered as a, a property. Uh, so as a result of the, uh, the uh, uh, collapse of the pelling industry, uh, things completely changed. In the 1940s, you also have the discovery of oil, uh, especially in Arabia and in the Gulf. Now, oil introduced a uh, cash economy. And ironically, uh, it also led to more exploitation of, uh, for the enslaved people because uh, owners began to rent uh, slaves to go and work and take part of almost sometimes 90% of their wages and so on. So instead of uh, oil economy becoming uh, a catalyst for the, uh, the, the development of wage labor, uh, it also created uh, an opportunity for uh, slave owners to uh, exploit the labor of their uh, slaves. Uh, in, uh, in, with regard to abolition, uh, it was only in the 1950s uh, uh, that, well, the first country to abolish slavery in the Gulf was Bahrain in 1937, uh, in Qatar in 1952, in Saudi Arabia in 1963. I mean, until that time, this slavery was still considered legal in these societies, and in Oman in 1971. Uh, in Qatar, that's a country that uh, where I did most of my research and spent a couple of years. Um, it was actually the first uh, shipment of oil in 1949. The revenue was used to compensate the slave owners. And interestingly, uh, Qatar is one of the first countries in this region to build a museum uh, uh, talking about the history of slavery in the region, which was officially opened in 2015. So that's really the first country in that region to address them. Now, uh, in connection with uh, the interests of these uh, uh, people in this area, I would like to focus on African cultural survivals in the region. Uh, the first process of uh, acculturation, most of the slaves came from African societies uh, uh, in Northeast Africa or East Africa. Some of them came from Muslim societies, some of them from uh, uh, non-Muslim societies, some of them were Christians, especially from Ethiopia and so on. So the first step was acculturation uh, and changing the slave names. In Arabia, slaves were given certain names that distinguished them from freeborn. They included the first names such as Bad, uh, Half Moon, Jauhar, Joel, uh, Mubarak, Blessed, and so forth. In some cases, uh, slaves were given uh, names of days such as Khamis, First Day, or Juma, Friday, or sub Saturday, and so forth. Uh, slaves from Ethiopia included Coptic Christians who were converted to Islam and given Muslim names. Uh, we have a story of uh, one of the testimonies, Muslim by the name of Mas'ud Ali. Uh, he uh, was escaped from Qatar to Bahrain in 1932 and told the British agent that he was a Christian and then his original name was Faraj and, and then it was changed to Mas'ud. Uh, renaming also applied to slaves who were captured from Muslim communities in East Africa and the Horn of Africa, uh, those who already have Muslim names. Uh, and this was also became very clear in the oral uh, accounts as well as the written documents. Although slaves became integral part of Gulf societies, they have retained a great deal of the cultural tradition of their homelands, which reflected the music, song, dance, religious rituals, uh, healing, language, folklore, and so forth. In many parts of the Arabian Peninsula, African cultural practice have become an integral part of the popular culture of the region. In this way, popular culture became one of the most important venues for unveiling the hidden social 
and cultural world of the enslaved people. As elsewhere, enslaved Africans in the Gulf carved out social spaces and constructed a culture of opposition through which they articulated their feelings, resistance, aspiration, away from the watchful eye of the master. These social spaces constituted a partial refuge from the humiliation and dignation of slavery and racism. African cultural tradition in Arabia reflected diver the diverse regional, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds uh, of people who came from this different region. Over the centuries, these Africans and their descendants formed an Im important communities in different parts of Arabia and the Gulf, uh, in Oman, in Yemen, Bahrain, Qatar, and so forth. African cultural practices are still vivid in these places and can be traced to specific regions in Northeast Africa as well as East Africa. One of the most popular and best known African cultural tradition in the Gulf was that which attracted considerable attention is what is called spirit position or Zar Buri. As in Northeast Africa, Zar in the Gulf was used for healing physical and mental illness. However, the practice was molded and adapted to suit the cultural milieu of the region. Several categories of spirit position rituals emerged in the Gulf, which reflected the region's multiple connections with uh, Africa. The best known brands were called Tambura, also known as the Nubani, or uh, uh, the Khait, and so forth. Uh, there are several differences between the Nubani and what is called the Lewa in terms of lyrics, tunes, and dancing style. According to uh, one of the practitioners of this, which we interviewed during the course of the museum, Fatma Shaddad, uh, who is one of the leading tambura performers in Qatar today, uh, the tambura is heavily dependent on the use of drums and the performance of, uh, uh, it was very vibrant. Spirit position performances uh, became an integral part of the culture of the people of African descent in the Gulf. Although the ritual were initially associated with healing, they gradually became more part of leisure and recreational activities. Performances were held every weekend on Thursday through Friday nights. They were also held to celebrate uh, Muslim feasts and so forth. The spirit position lyrics reveal a great deal about the experience of enslaved people. Some of them describe the journey during the so-called Middle Passage separation of families and relatives, treatment, uh, and life under slavery. For instance, some Nuban songs mention several places, both sides in, 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 along the Red Sea, uh, such as Sawakin, Mecca, uh, Mocha, uh, and so forth. In the calling of these places reveal the existence of a sense of ethnic identity and belonging to an imagined ancestral home. Uh, Tambora lyrics also express consistent yearning for freedom, and were transmitted orally from one generation to another. Uh, a song titled Fairuz tells the story of a young slave man uh, named Fairuz who was uh, sold and separated from his family on board a sailing sh uh, ship. The song expressed a desire that the ship be struck by uh, a wind that would return it back to his family. Uh, spirit position in the Gulf was not just a testimony to the resilience of African tradition, but it also played a pivotal role in the life of enslaved people. In addition to its healing function, the tambura songs uh, allowed these people to express their feelings and to cope with a resistant oppression of slavery and social deprivation. One of the uh, scholars from the region who herself was a person of African descent, Aisha Khalifa, argued that the slave experience of a spirit position was directly linked to the psychology of pale diving. Many divers became uh, uh, experienced an anxiety and depression while on board the diving ships. Diving in the deep waters often led to delusion, uh, hallucination, which was attributed to possession by certain uh, spirits. Even physical conditions such as uh, the decomposition caused by excess of uh, the divers, you know, uh, underneath the waters and so on, um, could also be attributed to supernatural uh, uh, condition. So the, in, in, in other words, the, the spirit position was not just a healing practice, but also became uh, used as a form of covert form of resistance, such as if you're refusing to work, 
When the slave became rebellious and refused to work, he was often referred to by Arabs as having been hit by Tansif uh, al or meaning the slave mode swing. Um, Tambura and their spirit position ceremonies were considered as heresy by conservative uh, establish, Muslim establishment. For instance, these rituals were never allowed in Saudi Arabia. In Qatar, uh, they, they was also tolerated for some time, but later on in the 1960s, uh, it was uh, officially banned. Um, spirit position ceremonies provided unmonitored and unauthorized social sites in which the enslaved people could articulate their feelings and enjoy themselves away from the yoke of the owner. Uh, they the, 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 uh, re regarded themselves, you know, the, for instance, uh, one uh, European traveler uh, observed uh, some of these performances uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Oman and wrote extensively uh, describing the motions and so forth. Now, uh, let me, uh, I will, we will talk about uh, um, uh, abolition. Uh, I'd like to turn to uh, the status of former uh, enslaved and their descendants in the Gulf uh, today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, slavery was officially abolished uh, uh, in 1950s, 1960s, and so on. Following the abolition of slavery, uh, Gulf countries had to deal with the fundamental question of determining the status of former slaves in these societies. It's important to point out that, that kingship and tribal affiliation play a vital role in defining personal identities in that region. As outsiders, the slaves were indeed kinless. In Qatar and other Gulf countries, former slaves were affiliated to the tribes and the clans of their former owners. Uh, for example, uh, if the slave first name was Mubarak and his former owner belonged to, say, a tribe called Hajiri, he would be called Mubarak al-Hajiri. If the owner from another tribe, it would be called the same way. Most important, uh, the Nationality Law of 1961 gave former slaves and their descendants full Qatari citizenship. Attaching former slaves to kingship groups uh, of their former owners was based on several considerations. Uh, in the first place, it was based on ancient uh, Arabian concept of wala or uh, uh, patron. The decision by Qatari rulers, uh, which was supported by Muslim legal opinion and customary law that affiliating the slaves to their uh, former owners. The affiliation of liberated slaves to the kingship groups gave them a sense of belonging, but also ensured the continuation of ties between them and former owners and the preservation of paternalistic relationship that existed under slavery. Descendants of former owners continued, or former slaves continued to visit their families uh, of the former owners uh, and uh, their descendants during certain occasions such as marriage, death, and the Muslim feasts and so forth. Uh, and this continued until uh, today. The scholars of the slave trade uh, uh, and uh, the emerging field of African diaspora, particularly in the Atlantic world, are intrigued by the fact that people of African descent in the Gulf and the Muslim world in general seem to not to have uh, a distinctively black African consciousness and a sentimental link with the, uh, the continent uh, uh, among the people of African descent and so on. As Paul Zaleza wrote, diasporas are complex social and cultural communities created out of real and imagined genealogies and geographical, cultural, racial, national, and uh, continental, and transnational of belonging, displacement, uh, recreation, constructed and conceived at multiple distances from the, uh, home, from the homeland. A diaspora is fashioned as much in the fluid context of social experiences, differentiation, and struggle, and through the transnational circuits of exchange and diasporic resources and uh, repertoire of power. Diasporic scholars also stress the fact that several elements uh, are necessary for the development of such consciousness. These include displacement from the homeland or, uh, or two or more foreign regions, formation of stable communities, rejection of an alienation by the host society, a feeling of injustice, uh, a real or imagined awareness of a common homeland, a desire to return or maintain link with the homeland, 
and the existence of a leadership that articulates this consciousness. Moreover, the racialization of the African diaspora, according to Edward Alpers, was based mainly on the Atlantic experience of slavery and forced migration. And moreover, the term diaspora itself remained vague and is often applied to all sorts of population movement, migration, or dispersal. Descendants of enslaved people in the Gulf today are separated from their home, uh, ancestral homes by several generations. The nature of slavery in the region did not lead to a concentration of large number of slaves uh, or the development of what you might call slave communities. Most important, however, was the way in which these people were assimilated into the culture of Gulf society mainly through language and religion. The absence of diasporic consciousness among the people of African descent in the Gulf does not mean that these people did not develop their own sense of identity. However, the redef redefinition of identity and the status of former slaves and their descendants is complex and was shaped by the prevailing social structure and cultural norm. Unlike the case of the African diaspora in the Atlantic world, uh, where African ancestry is a major part of their identity, people of African descent in Arabia and the Gulf uh, to a large extent were assimilated into the culture of that region. They see themselves as people with deep roots in the region an integral part of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the Gulf societies. Uh, they also take pride in the enormous sacrifice and contribution they made, their ancestors made to these societies. Uh, so that is, uh, so the, the other most important thing is, in my view, is also uh, the uh, development of oil economy, which really transformed the history of these regions and created such an enormous wealth uh, uh, to the extent that most of the people in this, uh, in this region wanted to be part of this very opulent uh, uh, society. Um, the former slaves and their descendants developed their own discourse to resist uh, ascription to low social status. They claimed that they have pure blood equal to that of noble clans since they were, uh, they were integrated part of Arabia. Uh, they uh, are superior to those uh, people in the Gulf who are of Iranian origin or uh, people of mixed blood and so forth. Um, nonetheless, despite the significant progress that was made in the integration of former slaves in uh, Gulf society, there are still vest vestiges of racial and color prejudice, which can be seen in the use of certain vocabulary relating to skin color and physical features in this region. Although the slaves in the Gulf came from various ethnic backgrounds and their skin color varied from black to brown to yellow to even white, uh, dark steel pigmentation is still associated with slavery and people of African descent are often referred to as Abid or uh, slaves, which is a source of uh, major conflicts. Uh, it's also important to, one important factor that we take into account is that uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, a major source of slaves uh, became Persia. One of the uh, main regions uh, was called Baluchistan, uh, the region be you know, between Iran and uh, Pakistan. And a large number of uh, people were enslaved from that region into the Gulf. So you have the, the presence of non-African slaves, and that also complicates the discussion about race and color in that region. Uh, uh, and this is a subject actually of uh, one area in which uh, the discussion about slavery became very vivid is uh, literature and novels. There are numerous novels that were written by people of African descent from Saudi Arabia and others, including one uh, who was actually the son of the Saudi king, uh, whose mother was enslaved from uh, Persia, from Baluchistan, and she told her story, uh, which published uh, in 2000. 13 or so is forbidden in, in, in Arabia and so forth. So the, the area of literature is also an important uh, area to look at. So finally to conclude, enslaved people from, the, from Africa who crossed the Red Sea in Arabia played a pivotal role in the history of the region. They and their descendants have made enormous contributions to the region's economy as well as cultural tradition. They carved out social spaces and constructed a culture of opposition through which they articulated their feelings, uh, resistance, and aspiration. The performance of rituals such as lewa, tambura, and other spirit possession activities reveal 
a hidden history of unorganized, spontaneous actions by the slaves and reveal the complex dynamics on of, Islam, of enslavement and its legacy in the Gulf. Thank you for listening. if you might tell us a little bit about your upbringing and, and so on, and arriving eventually at Ohio State University. I assume there were a few migrations involved in that respect. Yes, well, that would take another lecture, but. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, I originally come from Sudan, uh, where I grew up. Uh, I'm from the region um, known as Nubia, which is the ancient, uh, uh, the site of the ancient kingdoms of Nubia. Uh, I went to school there, and but I did migrate quite a lot. Uh, I first went to Nigeria, uh, spent a couple of years in Nigeria, and then after that I came to just south here to UC Santa Barbara, where I did my, went to graduate school. And then my first job was in North Carolina, and then New York City, and then uh, ending up in uh, uh, Ohio State. In, in between, I also spent uh, a Fulbright uh, year in Morocco, and I spent a total of three years in uh, in the Gulf in Qatar. That's where I started working on this project. Were there any cultural adjustments that you had to make in these migrations of any sort? Oh, obviously, from West Africa to Santa Barbara, <laughs> that's a major uh, shift, and then from Santa Barbara to the American South in South North Carolina, and then from New York City to the Midwest. That. Uh, these are all major cultural and, and you know, uh, the, the environmental <laughs> adjustments. Um, last year, I went to a gas station, and the gentleman came out and asked me if I was Persian. And uh, I told him, no, I, I, I was not. And um, he asked me, are you sure? Because he assumed <laughs> that because, I guess, of my physical yeah. characteristics, I must have come from that part of the world. I was wondering if you had any encounters of that sort where people were trying to figure out who and what you were in a sense. Uh, the only thing that actually interesting happened to me in Nigeria, uh -huh. and I had a big Afro, and I was in uh, uh, Ibadan in southern Nigeria, and uh, one taxi driver came to me and he said, are you a Negro? That's the term that was used in, in, the, in that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you get this, uh, the, the, I think people come, who come from the Horn of Africa, especially Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, you always encounter mm -hmm. uh, these uh, kind of questions when they, even within Africa itself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, very good. Um, maybe to start the conversation, I was um, uh, interested in your comments regarding uh, the acculturation process, and I wonder to what extent gender was involved in terms of issues of intermarriage, uh, courtship, etc. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might talk a bit about that aspect of the assimilation acculturation process. Uh, yes, actually, um, the uh, it's important also to uh, mention that the uh, a large number of people who were enslaved from whether it's from East Africa or from the Horn of Africa were women, mm -hmm. and especially from uh, Ethiopia and that region. Uh, historically, in Arabia. Um, you have these categories of slaves. Uh, and this cl classification was made by the Arab themselves. Mm -hmm. For instance, they, they develop all kinds of stereotypes. Uh, East African women would be suitable for menial labor. Uh, Ethiopians as concubines, Persians as concubines, and this sort of thing. Uh, one of the most important aspects of slavery in uh, that part of the world is, especially with regard to the status of uh, slave women, was the practice of concubinage. The uh, large number of uh, uh, female slaves were taken as concubines, mm -hmm. or we don't like to use the term concubines, maybe as wives. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a very complex status within the Islamic legal system. Uh, for instance, uh, the son of the, of, of, of the, uh, the slave wife uh, would automatically be considered free equal to his uh, the, you know, freeborn brothers and sisters and so forth. Uh, and, and there's a, just a, an elaborate and very complex uh, legal stipulations regarding the conditions of, uh, of female. So that's actually became one of the main uh, vehicles for assimilation and integration, that the sons uh, and the intermarriage between uh, 
slave women, uh, concubines, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you will, um, I'm also interested in the role of the British and their attempts to suppress the slave trade uh, in the area. Was there a consistent effort, or was it, um, how shall I say it, uh, ups and downs in terms of enforcement? And would you say that it was particularly uh, stringent, let us say, at certain periods as opposed to others in the 19th century? Yeah, that's the Well, uh, the European anti-slavery campaign that actually was fraught with all kinds of contradictions because uh, you know, the British were driven by the fact that they wanted to abolish the slave trade, not the slavery as an institution. They made a distinction. And they, their approach was that actually it was the British officials who propagated this notion that slavery in that region is benign. Uh, so basically they wanted to keep the practice and, the, and this, they did the same in Africa in the 20th century. So they focused mainly on combating the slave trade, uh, arguing that it would lead to a natural uh, death of, of slavery. So they basically did not want to intervene because they felt that it was going to upset the social system. They, uh, they also propagated the view that it, is, it has always been an integral part of Arabian society. So any attempt to abolish it would disrupt social structure, uh, lead to the decline of the economy, uh, and so forth. So that's why they tolerated it in terms of abolishing slavery itself. But they focused mainly on intercepting uh, ships that were coming from East Africa, using the British Navy, uh, and so on. And when they capture uh, the slave, they release them, and so on. Even in those agencies where they, what they call uh, consular mining mission, uh, when the slave escape and go to the British consulate, they would be given a paper, a piece of paper, uh, and uh, basically it would allow them to renegotiate the relationship between them and the owners. It's called manumission certificate. So for the most part, the slave would go back with this certificate, arm with this certificate, and so forth. So it was a mix really of um, uh, lots of contradictions in, in, in terms of um, uh, really not taking any serious steps to abolish slavery itself. Uh, uh, if I may, um, another question. Um, as you know, Morocco, for example, there yes. was a Spanish zone and a French zone following yes. World War I and in other parts of North Africa, etc. Yes. You would have similar. Was there any attempts on the part of the slaves to escape into those European zones? And, and if so, to what extent, if any, were they accepted? In, in, in Morocco, I'm not sure in, in terms of the... Because uh, uh, Morocco is, is, uh, is an interesting case because unlike any other parts of the Middle East, uh, the Muslim establishment, uh, especially the legal scholars, have been very much involved in the debate about the legality mm -hmm. of slavery and so forth. So I, uh, I studied some of the, uh, what they call fatwas or legal decrees uh, in which they talk about uh, the, you know, the abolition of slavery. So one important thing is that uh, people assume that the end of slavery in this region came only after the European intervention. Right. But actually there were local mechanisms for uh, uh, emancipation and, uh, and, and, and in fact, Islamic law provided many mechanism for um, uh, you know, manumission and so forth. So, yes. Well, if I may, I'll take one more question sure. for myself and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. Sure. Sure. Um, the, the dancing, for example, um, the physicality that's involved in, in dancing, uh, of course it varies from different parts of Africa and so on. I'm wondering about the physicality of the dance in terms of the movements and so on. Mm. Like in Cuba, mm. that was one of the prejudices that the elite had toward the introduction of any African form mm. of, of music and dance mm. was the physicality of the dance mm. that was against the European norms, let us say, mm. of the 19th century. I'm wondering how that developed in the case of the Persian Gulf, for example. Yeah, the, the spirit position actually um, is something similar, you could say that, to the voodoo and so on. It, the, the dance is part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person reached a state of trance. Uh, and it's supposed to be, uh, you know, the, the, uh, actually it creates space usually for uh, women to really express uh, their feelings away from the patriarchy and of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, so it provided them with this space and, and, and dancing is really, is a major part 
to reach that state of complete trance mm -hmm. uh, is, is a major part of the healing process. Uh, so that's, that, that's what, uh, what's, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. All right, we'll open it up for Q&A uh, Q here. Uh, raise your hand, there should be microphones distributed around so everyone can hear your question uh, in that respect. And we have a question here in front. I'm not sure, let's see, right here in the front. A microphone is coming to you. And we have another one over here, so maybe you can just get rid of the microphone now. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Allison. Um, thank you for talking to us today. And you mentioned that um, sons of slave women were born free. Uh, what about the daughters? Can you talk on that? Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the office, I should say the offsprings of uh, uh, slave wives uh, were considered free. Uh, the, both sons and daughters were considered yeah, uh, and equal to their... Yeah. I wondered, in the African countries, how were the slaves procured? Were there individuals or groups, or and how, how did that work? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Well, there are several ways uh, in which you, uh, slaves were, were um, uh, acquired. Um, first, I mean, the first question is, you know, what really created the demand for slaves? And there has been a great deal of debate among African scholars, uh, even, you know, to what it took call it slavery or not, uh, but they talk about, you know, different forms of dependent relationships uh, or coerced, you know, labor and so on. Uh, there are several, either the main method is through warfare, uh, prisoners of war, uh, sometimes uh, peop debt, people who were, you know, indebted to uh, rulers uh, and so on, sometimes kidnapping and so forth. And this is also linked to the Atlantic slave trade as, as we, the most recent research suggests that, you know, uh, it didn't just happen along the coast of West Africa. The process of enslavement happened in the interior and very often it might take uh, a year or more than that uh, for people who were sold multiple times until they finally uh, reached the coast. So there are several ways, uh, but for the most part, especially in West Africa in the 19th century, the warfare say within the kingdoms along the Ashanti kingdom, the Oyo kingdom, uh, warfare became a major source of, of enslavement. Uh, but in some, some areas, you know, also have just slave, uh, uh, you know, especially in Northeast Africa, when there was a demand, kidnapping became very uh, common, uh, organized rates and so forth for, for, for the, the, the purpose of export. Uh, purchase, uh, and there's a great deal of debate about uh, you know, the, all kinds of mechanisms for the, determining the buying and the selling of the slaves and even the physical characteristics of which determine the price and that kind of thing. Hi, my name is Imran. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, European interactions between European colonialists and Arab merchants uh, in East Africa at the time of the scramble for Africa and the institutionalization of colonialism? Good question. Well, I mean, remember, um, in the 19th century, uh, when you have uh, slavery basically was outlawed in the Atlantic, it was flourishing in East Africa, especially in the island of Zanzibar, especially after the Omani transferred their capital to Zanzibar in mid 19th century. So in the 19th century, you have an influx of European geographers, explorers, and people like David Livingstone who are exploring the sources of the Nile and so forth. And the anti-slavery campaign in East Africa actually became one of the main uh, you know, justifications for the conquest of the region because missionaries as well as explorers were telling European colonial powers, you know, you abolish slavery in the Atlantic coast, it exists here in, in East Africa. So that became a cry for uh, the uh, European intervention uh, and, and uh, one of the justification for the conquest of East Africa was to abolish uh, slavery. Uh, but later on, uh, in fact, they did not take any 
really serious steps to, 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 to abolish the practice itself. They, 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 they focus on abolishing the slave trade uh, rather than the institution itself. Until, uh, that's why it, it continued to exist until after World War II in many parts of Africa. Any other questions? Hi. I was wondering if in the aftermath of abolition there had been any significant out-migration movements? Uh, yes, the, the, the migration within, you mean from the Gulf? Yes, outside from the Gulf. Uh, no, well, there is a lot of circulation within the Gulf itself. Uh, you find people, for instance, from Qatar move to Bahrain, or, uh, or people who move to seek money mission, they stayed there because there was oil, you know, opportunities for employment. Large number moved to Saudi Arabia because uh, in Saudi Arabia, oil production was never disrupted by World War II. So uh, that, that provided also opportunities. So you have mobility within the Gulf itself. Uh, and of course, they had major incentive to stay because that, that's, that's a very wealthy region. So there's no reason for anyone to migrate outside. Uh, in fact, it became a major source of attraction for you know, foreign labor, as you, you know from Asia and elsewhere. Could you talk a little bit about the um, 20th century anti-slavery movement? Where did they come from? Were they religious in nature? Were they secular? Uh, in, in Africa or in the Gulf? Uh, uh, in the Gulf, please. Thank you. Uh, in, well, in the 20th century, um, uh, as I said, you know, oil became uh, uh, a major uh, impetus, really, in the, in the abolition. First, remember, the Gulf is unique, unlike Africa, where you have European powers actually have colonies. Uh, but in the Gulf, you don't have European colonies as such. You, know, you have these agencies. Uh, so it's a kind of protectorate. So you, you will never find any kind of British ad colonial administration in any of these regions. You have this uh, just a, a, a British representative, an agent in Bahrain, and so forth. So there was no actual physical presence. They relied on the local rulers, and they did not want to alienate these uh, local uh, rulers. Uh, so everything depended on the desire of the rulers and the, sl and the slave owners. What happened is that uh, the rulers' authority were very weak, given the nature of these societies. Uh, uh, they depended on tribal alliances. But oil produced them with uh, enough revenue and uh, gave them much more uh, power to be able to take actions. And that's actually what happened when, so all this, uh, the abolition happened by decrees from the rulers. Uh, the, 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 I mean, that's basically what, uh, and there was very strong resistance from the slave owners. Uh, so it really reflects the dynamics, the changing dynamics of the relationship between the rulers and the slave owning classes, uh, we, especially with, with, you know, with, with, with the, the revenue coming from oil and that kind of thing. That's why in Qatar, for instance, it only happened after oil production reached uh, a peak in 1949, the first shipment. And uh, it, there were some, uh, some uh, uh, movements in Bahrain uh, in the 1930s, and mainly because it, Bahrain is, uh, is uh, you have uh, Certain level is much more like advanced in terms of education and so forth, but um, none in in in, uh, uh, in other parts of the Gulf. In Morocco, there was there was a very strong movement from the ulama, from the religious scholars. Definitely, there was, uh, but not not in the Gulf as a grassroots movement. Hi. So earlier you talked about how we the closest thing we have to a slave narrative is the stories that they've told. Do you think that if we had a more formal slave narrative at the time, then we would have been able to abolish the institution itself more easily as opposed to just the slave trade? Um, well, I mean, at least if, if we had uh, more narratives, uh, I think uh, it would probably have provided us with a much bit better picture of the experience on the, on the li in the lives of the slaves. Uh, I mean, until now, uh, and even, even these, these testimonies are very limited. It's just, they tell the stories of those people who escaped and went to, uh, went to these agencies. But um, 
for the most part, that were males, so that we really don't, you know, very little about the experience of uh, slave women, uh, because for the majority of slave women, flight was not an option. Uh, so th uh, th there is still very limited. I think, uh, you know, if we had the slave narratives, um, I don't think it would have changed the situation, but it at least would have given us a much better understanding of uh, the, the, the conditions and the nature of slavery in these societies. I think your, your, your subject is, doesn't allow for a great deal of, of back, background knowledge mm -hmm. to, ask, to ask the questions and so on. Okay, if there's no more questions, thank you very much for your uh, presence. And uh, I trust some of you will go to the performance on November the 3rd at Zellerbach at 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.